Hello and good day or good morning or even good evening to each and every one of you. My name is Thomas Maniago from Schwind iTech Solutions and I'm glad to welcome you at our Schwind webinar about the topic customized treatment. First of all, I would like to thank you, my colleague, Dr. Samuel Abamasquera, as he is going to moderate the session. And I'm, and I'm very happy that Dr. David Kang, a very experienced surgeon, is also with us today. Thank you very much for your participation. Further, my gratitude expands to my colleagues, Ayuna Kessler and her background work to make this webinar possible, and the team from our application hotline and uh, customer support department who developed the workflow, which I'm going to present in a moment. And um, I already want to point out um, um, a further webinar, which is working with this topic of customized treatment with Dr. Bruce Allen, who is also, an, uh, let's say, an extension of this webinar, as we cannot bring all together and the time would be extended. Therefore, we split it, this webinar in a second part. So for today, uh, I thank you all of the participation. And I think we can interest, uh, we can expect interesting and exciting presentations and questions from your side. And I now give the word to my colleague uh, Samuel Abamasquera as a moderator. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Thank you for having me as a moderator in this in this occasion. Uh, yeah, there is uh, many things to to say, but uh, the first speaker will be Thomas uh, again. He will be showing us the workflow for customized treatments that uh, he and his team of 10 employees, 10 people or so, uh, really dedicated to help our customers, to help the physicians in planning the treatments the best possible way, and uh, developed also together with the, with R&D, uh, in order to have a, a method, a systematism for planning those, those sort of, of treatments. Uh, I'm sure it will be a very interesting one and this will certainly open space for questions that will be addressed at the, at the very end. Uh, Thomas, please go ahead and show us how uh, the workflow works. All right, so this is a workflow for customized treatments we are using in our application department at Schwind iTech Solutions. And uh, it has been grown over many months, many years, and this refer it reflects the status we have right now in our team and whenever there are cases and uh, patient data coming in, we follow this workflow of customized treatments. And this workflow has um, nine steps. And as an overview, the first step is anamnesis, then followed by the treatment preparation, and the third step as a decision tree. Refraction adjustment is step four and five, and then followed by the optimization ablation profile, which is step, step six and eight. At the end, we have a comparison of the treatment plan with diagnostic images. So I will shine some light on each step so that you can follow this and uh, you can see what is available and needed for us. So first of all, we have the step one with the availability of appropriate clinical data. And the following information is mandatory for us to to plan a customized treatment. So we need a topographic uh, file coming from a Schwind diagnostic device. We need pachymetry and uh, ideally from the Schwind series as this is a Scheinflug device which offers pachymetric information. But in case this device is not in, um, available, maybe per ultrasound or some um, other opportunities. Then of course we need the subjective manifest reflection we need the uncorrected and the corrected distance visual acuity. And also we ask, what is the intended treatment mode from you as a surgeon? Is it intrastromal or is it on the surface or is it a relief? So where is the focus at that moment? And then also very important for us is the general treatment target. Either you go for a refractive treatment where you really want to have an accurate refraction or maybe you decide for the therapeutic approach in order to minimize the tissue, which is still a way to optimize the visual acuity. Maybe the patient will not be amatropia, but you save tissue versus the reflective part where it will be accurate, but maybe more tissue will be needed. So this is the information we would like to have also in our um, um, information before we start. And then if there are any specific patient complaints, does he suffer from night vision or any problem 
So this is uh, mandatory information we need. Additionally, the following information is recommended. Abrometer refraction at four millimeter or at least the outer refraction. This is very helpful as well as the cyclo cycloplegic refraction. Cycloplegic refraction for hyperops and mixed astigmatism, but also sometimes it reveals surprises in myopic patients. So therefore it's good to have. We would appreciate to have the Schwinn diagnostic abrometer file coming from the Paramis, to have the scotopic pupil size, and to know about the planned optical zone which is going to be treated, or if it is a retreatment, what was treated before. If no Schwind abrometer is available, a test, a test with hard contact lens is useful to confirm if corneal wavefront treatment improves the corrected distance visual acuity. So this is also a good possibility to check if this might be a very helpful treatment. Also check with a pinhole test if the visual capacity um, will improve and which helps to determine if the problem is related to the retina or to the brain. And when the problem comes from the brain, maybe there's not many things we can do with reflective surgery. So these are the recommended ones. Step two is then preparing the diagnostic data. And therefore the following activities should be considered, especially if you send us these kind of files. So we always would like to have the data anonymized. So we don't see the patient name. Ideally, they have a patient ID, you have a transaction key or a CIS number from us, and only the patient initials. And instead of Thomas Maniago saying where he's born, you can say TM, and then maybe you select 1st of January and just uh, the year of birth or just entering the year. Then when we get these files, we perform a reprocess in the function with our software on our computer so that the series of Paramis um, file we receive is refreshed and recalculated. And we always check which selection or which measurement is the best, so to say our favorite. There are many tricks and tips of, uh, which are not part of this workflow because we typically achieve four, three, four, five measurements. And then we highlight which one is our favorite or the doctor already you do this highlight. Because otherwise you might decide one time for number one and the second time for number two when you discuss it. And finally, you're going to treat number three of these measurements. So therefore, as soon as possible, label out your favorite and then export these files into the Schwind over KCAM software. And then we already at step three, which is the decision tree. And this decision tree is especially for our Schwind uh, or KCAM software, but it works also without that. Um, it offers advantages using this or KCAM software because you can select the analysis diameter of six millimeter and um, you press apply to start this. Then you check if the corrected distance visual acuity is less than one, so very poor or poor. If your root mean square higher order is more than 0 0.5 diopters at six millimeter, and if the patient suffer from visual deficiencies. I want to point this out more, more clearly here. Therefore, we have this decision tree. It all starts with your ocular or corneal wavefront measurement. And then you check is the root mean square of the higher order aberrations low? Is it less than a quarter of a diopter? If they are less, they are highlighted in green. So green means everything okay and it goes on for a non-customized treatment, a so-called aberration-free treatment. If the root mean square is more than this 0.25, then the question is, is it also more than 0.5 or is it between this 25 and this 0.5? If it is between, it's indicated in the diagnostic device as a yellow uh, higher order aberration. And this votes to, or well, this brings us to that point here, which is a corrected distance visual acuity as a question. If the visual acuity is less than 2020, you end up uh, with here, oh no, sorry. If the visual acuity is better than 2020, so if the patient is seeing good, the next question is about any complaints about visual quality or night vision. If the visual acuity is good, if there are no complaints, and if all the higher orders are green or yellow, we end up in an aberration-free treatment. However, 
if there are complaints about the visual quality, you end up here in that not on that point. Or if your visual acuity is less than 2020, you also end up here. Or if you have a high symptomatic, higher order aberrations, either on the ocular or on the corneal wavefront, you enter also this path here and you end up here. And then at that point, it sums up and comes to this, where you check the difference between the ocular wavefront and the corneal wavefront. So you have both maps available ideally, and you check if the difference is significant. And if this difference of the root mean square higher order is more than 0 0.75, it is considered to be significant. In the most cases, it is not significant. And then you end up here, where you check about the measurement and you check about the availability of the diameter of your measure. So is your diameter in the ocular wavefront larger or smaller than in the corneal wavefront? Typically in the ocular wavefront, we are restricted by the pupil size as it goes through the pupillar opening by the measurement. So most typically the corneal wavefront is the larger area with the more measured points. So this votes clearly for a corneal wavefront. But in case the ocular wavefront is offering more data or you have disturbances in the corneal wavefront, this votes for an ocular wavefront. Or in case you have a significant difference between the ocular and the corneal wavefront, it votes for an ocular wavefront because then also internal aberrations are playing a significant role. And then if this is the case, we end up here and we say just check is there any indication and age or, or anything which relates to an intraocular lens exchange. If not, you go ahead with your ocular wavefront treatment. And if you want to exchange the lens, of course, you do this exchange first. So this is the decision tree which we use. And then we evaluate the higher order refraction. This is quite simple if you have the ORK cam available, because you can do this in the comparison mode. The higher order refraction is something you can uh, imagine. From all the higher orders existing, they have an influence on the sphere and cylinder and axis, and they change maybe the manifest refraction. And uh, this can be calculated, it can be measured, or out from the measurement it can be calculated, and therefore we call it a higher order refraction. It's not the real reflection, but it's going towards to influence the manifest reflection and the patient's uh, vision. If you have the Oracle CAM software, you choose the relevant ocular or corneal wavefront according to the previous decision coming from the decision tree. You change your analysis diameter to the blend optical zone, and press apply. And then you see this higher order reflection. You see this sphere cylinder axis calculated out from the higher orders and note this down because you might need it in a few steps ahead. But before these steps ahead are coming, we calculate as the next step the vectorial mean out from the reflection. Because when a customized treatment is recommended according to the decision tree, perform at first the reflection adjustment based on the summary of summary of manifest reflection, which you see here as an example in my table, aperometer reflection at four millimeter, which reflects the photopic situation. And if you don't have an aperometer available, you should go ahead with the autorefractometer value and enter this or, or check this. Then we have the topographical astigmatism coming from the K readings. And then we have the wavefront astigmatism at four millimeter and six millimeter. So we check for a smaller zone and a larger zone. And you can find this wavefront astigmatism on the diagnostic device, on the Schmidt Sirius, on the Scout, on the Peramis, on all these devices, you find it. And decide or based on the decision tree and on the decision if it goes for an ocular or on a corneal wavefront, you use this device and these values from the astigmatism either corneal or ocular, and you will consider this for your table. So you see here, we have two values for the sphere, five for the cylinder and axis. And of course, we have considered the vertex distance relevant for the manifest reflection and apogometer reflection. And then we calculate the vectorial mean. And uh, you see also the sphere can be reduced because it's a vectorial mean. And um, then we note down this reflection in my example here, 
this red line here, 0 0.72 with minus 0 0.8, and because uh, we might need it later on. So now we come on with the step six, a comparison of ablation profiles. Now, the first step is to evaluate the ablation profile in a non-customized treatment way, so the aberration-free mode with the manifest reflection. So what we, either you can choose an aberration-free treatment, enter your manifest reflection and note down the, uh, the maximum depth of ablation, or if you use the ORK cam, you load in your selected diagnostic file, which is either corneal or ocular wavefront, you load that into the ORK cam, and you use the subjective manifest reflection, so not the one from the vectorial mean, the really subjective manifest reflection, and the plain treatment method, LASIK or TransPRK, to select your optical zone and confirm with apply. And then you go into the manager in the ORK cam software, and you deactivate all the higher orders in the pyramid function. And then you go back in the main menu and you get the information about the ablation depth. So important in that step is we check for a regular treatment, non-customized with the manifest reflection, what is the depth of ablation and note this down. And then we also check what is the difference in ablation between the center of this ablation profile and the periphery, because this might give us some hints and information which are needed also later on. So you note this down and in the next step you make it very similar, you note down the depth of ablation. In the moment you have the higher order activated, in the moment you plan for a customized treatment and in the moment you go for the adjusted reflection coming from the vectorial mean. So here now it uh, describes customized treatments, either corneal or ocular wavefront. It describes uh, to use the reflection using from the vectorial mean, so the adjusted reflection. And if you are an ORCACAM user, you continue, you can continue with the previous settings. You just exchange or model edit the manifest reflection and enter the adjusted reflection from the vectorial mean calculation. And then you go into manager and activate all the higher order aberrations again. And once you press OK, you note down the ablation depth. So now we have the two values. One value again, aberration free with the original manifest reflection. And on the other hand, the customized treatment with the adjusted reflection. And then you make the subtraction. You, apply, uh, you make the difference between the maximum ablation in the customized treatment minus the maximum ablation in the aberration free treatment. For example, you had 15 microns depth of ablation in a customized and 35 in aberration free treatment. So the delta very easily would be 15 microns. So this 15 microns we keep for the moment in our mind and look on the next foil, because now it comes another factor in the game, which we call the tolerance factor. And the tolerance factor is, um, is calculated with this small formula and it uses also a depth of tolerance which is 10 microns which is our value because this this correspond, corresponds to a 0.75 diopter treatment so what we do here now we calculate an artificial tolerance factor based on the 15 microns which i subtracted before divided by the 10 microns I go one slide back now. You see here the maximum ablation was calculated in the in the blue line here, the delta with the maximum ablation depth minus the depth of ablation with aberration free. So this value is entered here. And as we said, it was before the 50 minus 35, so 15, and then 15 divided by 10 microns is 1.5. This is my tolerance factor in this example I'm using here. And then we come to the point where we optimize the ablation profile. And therefore, we follow this tolerance factor. If the tolerance factor is less than one, we have no change. You just go ahead and you continue your treatment planning. If your tolerance factor is between one and two, like in my example, you would go to the ORCA cam, choose pyramid, and you minimize your 
ablation volume or, or depth. If your tolerance factor is between two and three, which is then more, far more out of this, uh, then we go to the reflection value. We go into the Orca cam again. We choose the reflection with the default constraints and let the software look if there are some constraints which are tissue saving. And then on top of that, we go to pyramid again and minimize or minimize plus to further make a tissue saving. And straight from the beginning, if your tolerance factor is more than three, we go to reflection, use the extended constraints with the reflective values, which we noted down at the higher order reflection before. You probably remember some slides ago, we noted down the sphere cylinder or the influence from the higher orders about sphere and cylinder. And this we enter here in the extended constraints Let's the software search for a more reflection, which is more tissue saving. We go to pyramid also and minimize or minimize plus. And as a maximum, of course, for therapeutic treatments in the reflection module, you can disable all the constraints. So the whole range of reflection uh, of reflective power is used to find um, tissue saving um, sphere cylinder and axis. And on top of that, you still use the pyramid minimize or minimize plus. Also consider the following hints. Use a minimize depth and minimize volume function and decide for the most conservative profile. So we typically use both and see what is most efficient and more conservative. If the optimized ablation is out of the tolerance, then start from the beginning with the next higher tolerance factor. So it means Staying with my example of uh, 15 microns divided by 10, so tolerance factor is 1.5. So you go in the pyramid, you press minimize, and suddenly you get an um, ablation in a customized treatment, which is maybe 40 microns. So this 40 microns is close to my example with 35 microns. And if you then again calculate the difference, you end up with five microns. So the tolerance factor will be 0.5 and then it would be no change. That means you have to go at some point in time backwards and run through these uh, different steps, which is from time to time necessary, necessarily, but not very commonly. And the same holds if your optimization is less than aberration free then start from the beginning with the next lower tolerance factor. So either if you are so far out of that, uh, that this, optimization was so effective that you lower to the tolerance factor or you go to the next higher tolerance factor and then you repeat this again. Step eight is the optimization still of the ablation profile because in case of a mixed astigmatism or hyperopia some further optimization might be necessary. And here you evaluate the difference between central and peripheral ablation depth and compare with this value with the same central versus peripheral ablation depth, which you noted down in the aberration free mode with the manifest reflection. And when the difference is more than 10 micrometers, or is it, if it is within 10 micrometers, this profile is acceptable. But if this central to peripheral ablation is changing by more than 10 microns in versus uh, aberration free, then um, the value of change, uh, value of sphere should be changed until the, until the difference is within this, this limit. Because otherwise we might have an effect uh, postoperatively which we do not want. So in these rare cases, you should play a little bit with your sphere to optimize this. And finally, step nine, you compare your treatment plan with your diagnostic available information and check if there is a correlation in shape and depth or volume with the stromal ablation profile. If you compare it with the corner topography, if you compare it with the wavefront map, and if you compare it with the elevation map. So this is always we compare and bring in a personal kind of experience to see if, if our ablation profile matches and brings in our mind and benefit to this topography. And also check on the pre-op K reading. We have the pre-op K reading astigmatism, 
versus the uh, estimated post op k reading astigmatism. The software calculates the post op k readings. And if the axis turns between the pre op and post op astigmatism, it is suspicious. So you might have a situation where the pre op astigmatism is with the rule and post op against the rule. This is suspicious. So maybe it's better to rerun through this process. If the post op difference in the k readings is higher than the pre op difference in the k reading, then it's also suspicious. In my example, clearly you can see the pre op k reading was two diopter of astigmatism, and the expected post op k reading is suddenly three diopter of astigmatism. Then a readjustment and readjusting of reflection might be advisable. So, this is also a small hint at the end if what we have done before is uh, helpful and uh, fulfilling this. As a summary, the following steps should be applied to receive a predict customized treatment plan. Availability, appropriate clinical data. You should have this data available. You have to prepare the diagnostic data. You have to find out which is your favorite, the best one. You select the treatment type by the Schwind decision tree. You evaluate the higher order refraction and note this down. You calculate, or you have to calculate and find out your adjusted refraction, which is based on the vectorial mean, which considers all these parameters. Then you compare the ablation profiles and you calculate your tolerance factors. And out from this tolerance factor, you optimize your ablation profile. And once you have your optimized ablation profile, you compare it with the diagnostics. That brings me to my last foil, which is an overview of what we wrote down, what we, what we have for ourselves, the patient data, number of uh, best diagnostics, examination, parametric, scot topic, visual acuity. What is the target? I mentioned you want to save tissue and improve visual acuity, accepting that the reflection might not be accurate, or you want to have accurate reflection and accurate uh, and, um, and, uh, and improved uh, visual acuity. You plan ocular or corneal wavefront, you know down the optical zone. And here this table is used by ourselves or which can be used also from yourself to enter these values to have an overview and to see this. And here also you can note down the depth of ablation in aberration free mode and the difference center to periphery and then in customized mode. So this data summary here is designed to have all this information at one glance. And I can imagine that now as we have run through this presentation that it might be a little bit uh, confusing at some point and you might not be remember. But as this will be available in, and recorded and then will be available, um, it will be spread it. And also we can share this presentation and make this available. And we are available for further questions for that as well. So that brings me to my end. And thank you very much for your attendance and for listening. Thank you, Thomas. And this was, I think, a very thoughtful, very good presentation of what the constraints are and what is the the aims when you plan when you plan the treatments for difficult cases uh, in a sense. Uh, there are a couple of questions already, but as mentioned, we will uh, defer them to the f uh, end of the uh, of the discussion uh, because now we will see a few cases by David Kang uh, that they are not necessarily following exactly the workflow as uh, shown by uh, by Thomas, but at least we'll show how a clinician really approaches these uh, these cases. And I think uh, this is all it is, it is about. Uh, how to balance, how is the, the waiting, how we can show uh, what to do with the system, the Amaris is capable of doing many things, and how the clinicians may benefit of uh, of this. Uh, David Kang is uh, is a long-term friend of mine. I can say through the through the uh, connection at uh, uh, at Twin, and it is a very special person. When you have a, a, a question on the clinical nature of what will be or have you seen these in cases before, you send the question by email, you submit it, and maybe 15 minutes later or latest 15 hours later, you don't have the answer. You have the data to analyze yourself. 
Uh, so I think he has a vast, uh, immense experience in treating normal and abnormal cases. And I'm really pleased to listen to your presentation, David. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. My name is David. I'm talking to you from Seoul, Korea. The current time over here is just over 7.35 p.m. Now, I first started with corneal wavefront guided surgery about 10 years ago. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Sam, Thomas, and Tobias, and everyone at customer support for uh, their perseverance in answering all my questions to the millions of probably millions of emails that I've, I've sent them. And the most abundant form of pathologic corneas we probably ablate are primary character conics. Although other forms, of course, are treated. Oops, sorry. Okay. Mm. In order to get to a good level of therapeutics is, I think, to start with virgin corneas. Your everyday aberration-free treatments should be corneal wafer guided. In order to run, we must first learn how to walk. And once you, your technicians, and your OR nurses get familiar with corneal wafer guided surgery, the easier it will become to plan and execute these procedures. These are the seven things I try to remember when planning. First and foremost, I believe the goals of treatment should be embedded in our minds in order for them to be imprinted in the minds of our patients. We must view pathologic corneas from a therapeutic perspective and not always as a refractive one. Our most paramount goal is to alleviate corneal high order aberrations for better best corrected vision. If the necessary ablation can be accomplished with also the correction of sphere and cylinder, the better it is, of course, but it should never be the primary goal. This brings us to our second point, that a second of sur uh, surgical procedure operation is entirely possible, especially treating small optical zones will more than likely end up with myopic shifts since your primary ablation pattern would be hyperopic in nature. Treating decentrations can end up with unwanted astigmatism, as is treating character corners that invariably end up with, with the rule astigmatism. But that, of course, is better than irregular astigmatism. But for all of, all of these things, we would have bettered the BCVA and come back to address the remaining low order aberrations another day or even by a totally different modality. Third, Tissue is at an incredible premium in some of these eyes. So in effect, low ablations are the rule. Let's not create a more difficult problem while solving one thing. No one rule fits all, and ablation thresholds are different to every situation. We cannot apply the same standards to ectasia to simple decentrations. Fourth, Aim for the largest possible optical zone. Sacrifice some sphere and cylinder if you have to. It is always better to cover the entire pathology completely. The oldest rule that bigger optical zones will result in deeper ablations are sometimes not true in some of these cases. So please take your time to discover what you can do with larger ablations and then work your way smaller and smaller. Five. Determine the type of offset. Of course, asymmetric offsets are the default settings in nearly all Schwinn treatments. They save volume, but in very less than maybe 5% of the cases, symmetric offsets can fit the topography more perfectly in some of these instances. Trial and error is the key. Six. And I think this is probably the most important point is that you need to become friends with the refraction manager. The pyramid manager will take care of itself. In fact, if you do not even touch the pyramid manager, then you will know before you have even begun that the results will actually be spectacular. As refractive surgeons, we are more than obsessed with getting the perfect refraction and are not really accustomed 
to tweaking the patient's refraction for better post-op corneal hyoidal aberrations. It was very difficult for me too in the beginning, and I remember sitting in front of the pyramid manager and deleting one hyoidal aberration at a time to tr try to find a fix and to save ablation depth. This time is more wisely spent with the refraction manager. Remember high order aberrations first, then worry about the low order aberrations. In a most extreme case, if we input zero sphere, zero cylinder into the OL cam, strike all constraints off in the refraction manager, and then do the minimization, that will show the minimal amount of ablation that is required to correct corneal high order aberrations without regard for any uh, sphere or cylinder. So that would actually be a high order aberration only ablation profile. And I always have that handy alongside with low order aberration or aberration free uh, ablation profile and try to uh, come to a, to, a, to a spectrum where these two can agree with each other, uh, regardless of the res resulting refraction post-op. But of course, we never do this in real life because uh, we care of the patient's refraction and we'll tweak it in there somehow for that one ablation. Seven, determine the amount of cylinder that you're going to treat first. The sphere will take care of itself. Couplings in the high order aberrations always compare the four and seven millimeter corneal wavefront guided maps, especially coma and astigmatism, to see whether their axes are corresponding. If they're not cor corresponding, then I always take into uh, account the Maloney case at the central three millimeters that will find the flattest part and axis of that cornea. Spherical equivalent from a wavefront aberrometer, or at, at worst, uh, an autorefractometer, can always be used to determine sphere after you decide on a cylinder to treat. Okay, this is the first case, and it, 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 was, it was an ectasia followed by femtolasic. BCVA was 0 0.6 Snellen with a pinhole. You can see the highly localized cone and a rather large divot from 10 all the way around 4 o'clock in the sagittal map. But actually, in the tangential map, we can discern the original optical zone right there and the protruding cone from the inferotemporal region of the bed. Now, high disparity in curvature seen here will require more ablation to completely flatten this cone. Primary keratoconics are much easier to plan to treat. I wanted to show this case because the effects of using a symmetric offset is really quite well shown here. Pachymetry is shown to be 469, which was not at all bad, and I felt we had about 60 and, or maybe even pushing it to 70 microns to work with. So let's first, first find the cylinder to correct. Axis of astigmatism at 4, 6, and 7 millimeters are 57, 51, and 40 degrees, so agreeing rather well. Four, six, and seven millimeters. But the magnitude of astigmatism decreases from minus 4.77, minus 21.217, and to minus 1.41 diopters, as should for corneas with highly localized cones. So let's aim for a with the rule cornea post op with about a diopter of toricity. That's the Maloney K. It was a 288 at 23 degrees. And here we have the spherical equivalent, minus 2.43. And we have decided to aim for a with the rule cornea, which is about physiologic. Working from the case above, this would lead to minus 2.69 with an axis of 32. We actually did this from the Maloney case. And if we treat that, then the cornea will become completely spherical. And in order to save tissue, as well as leaving behind with the rule astigmatism to be physiologic, we tweak this to find this. And from the spherical equivalent of the ALK, we can work out the sphere to be just over minus one. 
Now put this refraction into the refraction manager to find the optimal refraction whilst minimizing ablation depth and you will result in this refraction. And then we can do some more minimization in the pyramid manager to save tissue. So that was the refraction that we treated for this case. And of course, there are other considerations to make. Of course, optical zone, we have to cover the pathology, the epithelium, and not just pre-op, but also post-op epithelium is our friend. It will uh, later remodel with hyperplasia to cover any dents. And in this instance, we used symmetric ablations. Deciding between symmetric versus asymmetric offsets is actually uh, beyond the scope of this talk, but I just wanted to take in that uh, about 5% of cases are better treated with symmetric offsets. And this comes from the master Jedi, Samuel. Uh, he always starts, he's always told me to start with a big, big optical zone of 7.5 millimeters at first asymmetric, do the optimizations, and if they're good, then go. Otherwise, we repeat for seven, again, asymmetric offset. If no good, then we repeat for seven again, but with a symmetric offset. And if that's no good, then we do a manipulated symmetric offset. And then we go down to 6.5, but never try to go below 6.5, but that will not cover uh, enough for the pathology. Uh, that, that should not really do the trick. So this was our final ablation. The maximum ablation was calculated to be 112 microns. That of course includes the epithelium. Stromal maximum ablation on the cone was 63. We used a symmetric offset and of an offset of one millimeter at 53 degrees because uh, the OLK cam will accept only the uh, one millimeter as the as, the, as, as its greatest offset value. Uh, most probably the cone here had an offset of about maybe between one and two, but one millimeter of offset is all you're gonna get. And of course you see the reciprocal wing, and we performed it seven millimeters optical zone for a total ablation zone of 8.8 eight and a half. That reciprocal wing will steepen this axis that ablation will flatten the cone and hopefully we'll end up with with that kind of looking regular astigmatism okay we started with that topography we added that in as an ablation profile and in four months uh, we came out with this and if you see the central cornea the k's are much more universal now and the pachymetry is still very, very respectable with a manifest refraction of minus 275 sphere, minus one cylinder, and an axis of 158. And of course, this is nowhere near emitropic, but uh, in some of these instances, we're not going to achieve both uh, low and high order aberration perfections. And we plan to Im implant a toric ICL maybe in about a year's time to this year, to this eye. Okay, for case number two, a novice surgeon at our clinic applied ablation on an irregularly wet bed after he lifted the femto flap. And this perfect cornea became high, highly irregular, like so. Most probably, the nasal regions and the center were affected with more liquid on the bed, and the temporal regions were quite spared. Luckily, we had a lot of tissue to work with. Pachymetry shows 488 microns of tissue. The epithelium was already becoming irregular in remodeling, but Maloney case was showing more than five and a half diopters of cylinder in the central three millimeters. Four and seven millimeter corneal wavefronts show relative correspondence of axis and in, and in astigmatism and coma but a slight discrepancy in the magnitude of astigmatism only. These are the patient's refraction. So we tabulate the different re refractions that are possible. Based on current autorefractometer and the manifest refraction, 
plus three and a quarter minus three and a quarter at 173 degrees. Based on current K readings of the Maloney, plus three and a half minus five at axis 168. Based on the current Ks of Maloney with vector, vector planning, taking into account the ocular residual astigmatism, we'll have 550 at 170 degrees. And based on simple minimization volume, we would have plus 375, minus 375 at 167. Based on the original target case, we would have minus 465 at 166. And original target case with consideration of ORA, we would have minus 525 at 170. Now, all these refractions seem quite similar. So for the sphere is in the range of three and a quarter up to plus four. Cylinder is in the range of minus three and a quarter to minus five and a half. Axis is very tight at 166 and 173. So we took medians. Plus 375, minus four, to four and a quarter at an axis of 169 and performed corneal wavefront guided trans PRK with an optical zone of 7.7 .7, and we did the maximum uh, pyramid manager minimizations that was possible. Now, why 7.7 .7 optical zone? Because that was the amount of cornea that our scout keratometer was able to procure data from. Now, we could go 7.5, but why not go 7.7 .7 if we had the data to work with? And this is the ablation profile. We performed that ablation and did the, did the pyramid uh, minimizations. And this cornea went from that to this, very regular, with a refraction of minus 0 0.5 sphere, minus quarter cell against the rule, with BCVA of 0 0.9. And, uh, well, the patient is quite happy. And so I do not think we're going to uh, re-ablate that uh, cornea again, but, uh, we could because we have, uh, I think, enough pachymetry. Case three, a decented uh, post-PLK patient walked into the clinic one day. A 48-year-old woman, she comes to me and says she wants her reading glasses gone. She had been treated by, by PLK more than 20 years ago. We find a very small optical zone, decented ablation, she was quite lucky that she was seeing 0 0.9 best corrected. Along with the very small optical zone, we found extensive epithelial hyperplasia. Spherical aberration from the small optical zone and coma from the decentration were the main pathologies. Luckily, we had about 500 microns of cornea to work with. We planned for a presbiopic treatment with Presbimax. Uh, we wanted to uh, induce negative spherical aberration for this, for this case. And we ablated plus 2.32 sphere and three quarter cell at an axis of 115 degrees with a small add of one and a quarter. So we took this cornea and ablated it with this pattern. This cornea with this pattern. See how the pattern matches the tangential topography almost perfectly. The resulting topography show a much wider optical zone with the characteristic negative spherical aberration induced by the Presbymax profile. However, at four months, the patient's manifest refraction was minus 3.75, minus 0 0.37 cylinder at 140. She was corrected to 2020. She was, of course, and very obviously not so very happy. But because she had a very small total spherical aberration in her cornea, we performed a clear lens extraction with a multifocal. She's seeing 2020 unaided and J1, and is a very, very happy woman. So you see, corneal wavefront guided is not always bang on the dot with both high order aberrations and refraction. And sometimes there are cases when you need to find some other modality to fulfill that final goal. In the last case, guys, case four. This was a, a failed smile with a remnant lenticular fragment trapped inside the cap. And patient, this patient was actually referred to us. He had a smile about a year ago. The left eye had 
a good outcome, but the right eye had a very aberrated cornea. What was interesting was that pachymetry was conserved in this eye. On slit lamp examination, we could observe the remnants of a lenticule that was probably never extracted. OCT reveals hypoechoic lesions in the central part of the cornea here, corresponding to these tissue fluffs. Inferior epithelium is thinned out corresponding to maybe a curvature increase with the lenticle possibly wrapped up around itself. The current nature of the lenticle could not be ascertained. And my first intentions, of course, were to extract that lenticle, but without exact three-dimensional uh, characteristic of that lenticle being intact, that idea was dropped. Refraction was minus three, minus 162 at 152 degrees, but best corrected was just under 0 0.6. Working from the four, five, and seven millimeter Ks and refraction managers before, we ablated this pattern at minus two and a half sphere, minus three cell at 50 degrees at an optical zone of 7.3 to cover 9.04 millimeters of cornea. At six months post-op, the difference map shows very satisfying results with a manifest refraction of just half a diopter of myopia with a UCVA of just under 0 0.9. We actually were fortunate enough to publish this case in the therapeutic section of the JRS earlier this year. So thank you guys, and I hope these cases uh, gave some of you a lot of courage to uh, to try going away from guided. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, these were really, really uh, illustrating cases of what can be done with the custom treatments, in particular, what can be done with the uh, with the Maris, uh, uh, device. Uh, we enter now the discussion section. We are very good in time, uh, I must say. And as it used to be the case, uh, I would like first the panel to allow to start the question before we go to the to the audience. Uh, David, do you have any question for for Thomas? Thomas, yeah, you see that tabulation that you showed earlier. That way Which we one? can the tabulations, the table yeah. that physicians could fill in. Yeah, the further reflection. Yes, you know, the, the, the refractions, the ablation depths uh, for each treatment modality. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. where, where can I download that? <laughs> Good question. Good question, yeah. We will make it available and um, we can send it out. At the moment, there's no place to download it. Well, there is a place which is called the Schwind Portal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will put this presentation, including this. It would be great if you know we could get a hold of that table. It would be very handy. Okay, yeah. we will arrange it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, now it's your turn, Thomas. Any question on on David? Mm, yeah, maybe maybe um, you are a strong advocate for corneal wavefront treatment. Are you missing from time to time the possibility or the ocular wavefront? Or uh, what is the situation for you? Okay. Uh, why, why, well, the pathology is on the cornea. So we need to treat that pathology because the crystalline lens is going to age and change with time. Hmm. So if we can make, in theory, a perfect spherical cornea in, let's say, a decentered eye, like I just showed you, and perform cataract surgery, what are we going to do when a keratoconic is treated with ocular wavefront on the cornea, ages, and develops cataract? We treat the cataract, and we're still left with an aberrated cornea, for that patient to live the remaining 30 or 40 years of his life with still an aberrated cornea and now with less tissue than before his ocular wavefront guided surgery. Okay. So that's, that's my two cents. Yeah. <laughs> now I agree yeah. that we can save more tissue with ocular wavefront guided surgery since ocular wavefront guided surgery will also take into regard the situation of the posterior cornea. No doubt, but that patient is not going to 
is not is is not going to die before he's 60 or 70. He will one day develop cataracts. And uh, you know, what am I going to say to that patient? Mm, sorry. Well, of course, in 20 or 30 years' time, maybe we could have a customized IOL. And if we remove the cataract and implant the customized IOL to cover the remaining cone, then that would, of course, work for me too. Yeah. On the other hand, if you have an, um, an intraocular, um, if you have a lens astigmatism or um, a situation on the endothelial side of the cornea, on the back side of the cornea, which is maybe changing the visual acuity in a younger patient, then you cannot help him at not in that moment in time. If you have a patient in the 2030s with a lens astigmatism, mm -hmm. then um, in that moment in time, maybe it's a IOL exchange is not a good choice. Well, that's why we always take into regard ocular wavefront for every procedure. If that yeah. patient does have uh, lenticular astigmatism of let's say one or maybe one and a half which is uh, more or less within the range of physiologic then maybe we could take that into account when we take uh, that into surgery but I'm more worried about mm, my 60s and my 70s <laughs> and I think we should worry about our patients 60s and 70s too absolutely yeah absolutely thank you thank uh, you so i would have a question uh, for you david you have a relatively high volume uh, clinic uh, so how many of the treatments you perform you consider difficult uh, so, which proportion of, of treatments are difficult? Because you mentioned in one of your slides, and this is very much corresponding to what all these advocates for custom treatments uh, uh, say, that uh, doing customized in routine cases keeps you fit yes. for those cases that really need your, your custom strength. So can mm -hmm. you put the put the figure there? Uh, is one percent of the treatments is one per thousand? Mm, I would say difficult cases, uh, maybe once every one or two weeks. Okay. So in your case, it's, mm -hmm. it's rare. sometimes two or three cases a week. Sometimes even not even a case in a month. But you know, on average, I would say one or two cases every two weeks. Okay, excellent, excellent. But excellent. you know, it's like a snowball. You do more and more of these difficult cases, and you know, it's like a magnet. And you know, these patients find out that you can do this, and they, you know, they come to you. But of course, I don't treat all of them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but you know, that's how the you know, I think it's, it's like a snowball. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, another question for for you, but also David, you are uh, and, uh, uh, welcome to to answer. Uh, I think you mentioned this somewhat in your presentation, but uh, uh, but maybe a bit too unspecific. Uh, now there is an advent of OCTs that they can also provide the um, accurate uh, epithelium measurements. Uh, what would be the recommendation or the consideration in, in the in the workflow what to do with the with the epithelium if it deviates mm -hmm. from from the standard let's say yeah so uh, it was not mentioned in the workflow um, but uh, if this kind of data is available it's a, a very valuable information so what we typically use in that moment we if you decide for surface treatment you use the central thickness of the epithelium and enter this in our TECM. And uh, instead of the 55, so you use the measurement from the OCT. And then for the peripheral value, we typically accept what the OR TECM is proposing. So the software, the OR TECM is automatically calculating and we rarely enter the peripheral value in the ablation profile. Mm -hmm. 
because the, um, the software currently only offers the opportunity to enter one value for the peripheral, which indicates or which is supposed for all directions. But if you have an OCT, you have four quadrants or maybe you have eight uh, sections. And of course, you can make a mean value, but when it becomes irregular, it becomes tricky. So therefore, uh, at the moment, we suggest to use a central value and to let the software calculate the peripheral value. If you plan for a LASIK treatment or not using this TransPRK epithelial information, it still might be useful, especially if you have a keratoconic patient um, where the epithelial is thinner, which is maybe not 55, but it's around 45. Yeah. And then it's a point where, um, where the life becomes very colorful because we can either <laughs> reduce the ablation profile a little bit uh, by 5-10 microns, but uh, in a lot of cases we we also ignore this, which would then consequently lead to a little bit more ablation at the cone itself. So maybe David can add some points to that. Well, I always check uh, all my epithelium uh, with every eye before I operate on, on these cases, of course with an OCT up to nine millimeters. And uh, I tried to incorporate that into the ablation depth. And interesting enough, as you say, uh, steeper corneas, well, steeper areas will of course end up with a thinner epithelium. And I try to incorporate that by tweaking the epithelial profile for the trans-PRK. And interesting enough, uh, I had the, the privilege of working with Sam to solve an epithelial astigmat case and presented it at ESCRS a few years ago. I think it was London, I'm not so sure, maybe it was Barcelona. But uh, we took epithelial measurements, I think about 30 times for that eye. And we constantly ended up with epithelial astigmatism in an eye that had no cylinder in its manifest refraction. So it had previous surgery, of course, and the epithelium had, had hyperplased in an astigmatic fashion. It was uh, very bizarre and very new to me, but uh, we finally got down to the, t uh, the bottom of the problem and solved it. Well, actually, it was Sam's calculations that solved it, and that patient is, is very happy now. So I think epithelium, taking into consideration of epithelium in these cases is very important. Okay, thank you. But we have a couple of very interesting questions by the by the audience. Uh, so again, back to you, Thomas. Uh, the first question is, what if someone only has corneal topography, thus only corneal wavefront, but not ocular wavefront available? Uh, how can this plug into the the workflow? Yeah, well, it, it will limit us in our information, but anyhow, we still can continue, of course. And uh, in some cases, you have an alternative available with another abrometer, another device, which is not linked to the Exama Laser Amaris. And uh, you can use this refraction from this device. You can use the refraction from an auto refractometer instead. And um, but at some point in time, um, it will limit us in the workflow. Maybe you remember the decision tree I have shown, and there was in many uh, decision uh, rectangles or squares, it was ocular and corneal wavefront, and if there is a difference on that. If you don't know if there is a difference, it just goes following this decision tree without the opportunity of an ocular wavefront. So it votes either for aberration free or corneal wavefront. So it limits us in a somehow, but you still can use this workflow and the recommendations which we have presented in this workflow. The reverse also applies if someone, it is much more unlikely, but if someone would only have a uh, ocular wavefront, I know two cases uh, like that, uh, but if someone would only have ocular wavefront, uh, would you feel the topography as inferred from, from David's comment is more important and is essential, or would you apply a reduced version of the of the workflow for for ocular wavefront only? If you have a, an ocular wavefront only, I would assume 
that any topography will be available because you should also check the topography yeah so probably it's from another manufacturer which is not linked to okay. the uh, to the examiner laser yeah. if this external information from an external topographer matches with the corneal wave uh, with the ocular wavefront i would follow this workflow this guidance also for pure ocular wavefront treatment yeah but if you have indeed if you have a situation where we have no topographic system or information available i would uh, do nothing i would do a regular treatment uh, non fair enough, fair enough. Uh, there is another question uh, i think this was the question that you understood from 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 david but uh, but was finally uh, different uh, there is a question of, of how calculating the vectorial refraction so for me this is simple mathematics but is there a, a, a policy to make uh, something available or to make uh, training materials for for physicians with interest of doing by themselves, Thomas? Yeah, I was expecting this kind of question about this <laughs> table. <laughs> yeah, because um, as the MDR are coming closer and as we have some European regulations about computer software validation, we are actually in a phase to validate this software. And depending on, on the process, we have to see if we are allowed to make it available and if we want to do so, how other consequences it will have on our documentation and on our uh, yeah, documents we have to fulfill and tests we have to do. So currently it is, it is not available, but we can support with the mathematics or with some ideas to uh, calculate this vectorial mean because the formulas are published they are tricky absolutely um, but um, we cannot spread this table at the moment as it is uh, but, but maybe or, maybe if someone would have the interest if not the table uh, we could deliver the the basics behind so that they can do it by themselves yeah the idea behind so they can develop this uh, Excel table by themselves. We can help and see if they, uh, um, if it matches with our table, yeah. And let's see if 2021 will bring some change for that. There is another interesting question, and, and uh, David, there are also questions for you, but this is again for Thomas. And the question is, when determining the difference between ocular and corneal wavefront, uh, what uh, would we recommend? The difference as shown in the comparison of the ORK CAM, or why not directly using the difference as shown, for instance, in the Pyramids, in the Phoenix software of the Pyramids device itself? Hmm. Yeah, when we import the corner wavefront or the ocular wavefront or both into the ORK CAM, we bring it to one eye model, to one model of calculation, and then the two corner wavefront and ocular wavefront are really comparable. If you compare it separately on the different devices, uh, or uh, mm, then you might have a different eye model in behind. Yeah. Therefore, if you bring it into the ORK cam, they will be much more trustable and reliable. And therefore, we, this is our recommendation. And this is our way we always do it. Yeah. Uh, essentially, because then you are comparing exactly what would be driving the treatment if you would go for one or the other in the Amaris. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Now, David, uh, there is also a question for you. As mentioned before, uh, is from which age, at which uh, age would you encourage lens exchange or corneal wavefront or combine corneal wavefront first? to recover the corneal morphology and lens, lens exchange afterwards. So is there, uh, Thomas asked about the 25 year old, is there a sort of a, of a cut off value that, that you can give us a? Now I wouldn't recommend uh, refractive lens exchange to any eye that was not presbyopic. Mm -hmm. So 25 year old, she will yeah. have to wait another 20 years. I mean, there are other alternatives. We can implant toric ICLs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, lens exchange isn't really necessary for them. I mean, the only reason that I 
did a lens exchange for that lady was because uh, she was getting very press biopic and um, her chamber depths were about two and a half millimeters and there was actually no room for an ICL to fit in there. Yeah, and uh, this is probably also related to, to, to the same question or at least this is what I read between the lines. Uh, intuitively, uh, one may think I do the lens exchange first, see what happens and if required, I do the wavefront afterwards. No, 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 now, no. no. The, point is, the point is, if you do this, you may you may have calculated the lens for a condition that is no longer giving in the cornea, and then you may fail refraction. Yes. Uh, so, uh, then in which cases would you say, no, I have to do a wavefront first to make this cornea beautiful, mm -hmm. and then with a better cornea, calculate the, IO, uh, the IOL? Okay. If a patient has a perfectly good cornea, no, no aberrations, then we could consider a cataract procedure, a multifocal. And because of the aberrated nature of that cornea, we could not uh, implant a multifocal. Now, we could have implanted a monofocal, but then uh, she would have lost all the benefits of a multi. And of course, she does have a very small optical zone and lots of spherical aberrations, so she might even have pseudo accommodation, but it was still decentered. So I would say if you would do a cataract procedure first and end up with something that you do not desire, then you have to ablate the cornea later. And that would somehow change the eye's refraction. And then you may have to perform a second procedure on the cornea again. So it's much safer to perform the corneal surgery first, get good spherical aberrations and good case, and then calculate correctly for the IOL power, and then do the cataract procedure later. And that first treatment would really go to the uh, to the streamline of of minimum amount of tissue to be removed. So simply to regularize the, the cornea regardless of the potential residual refraction. Well, of course, if we could regularize the cornea and treat the lower order aberrations at the same time at the first go, then, you know, that would be the best of both worlds. But in this instance, that did not happen. So we did the next best thing. So you take it from there, one modality to the next. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And there is Another question that I can address to both of you, but maybe I, I may also answer something, though it's not the role of the moderator. Uh, it is, you mentioned, David, it's not common, but it may occur that the epithelium itself, uh, in at least one occasion, have a very clinically relevant amount of astigmatism. So there was a sort of, of toric epithelial lens. And uh, then the question is, since in the, at the Amaris, in the ORK cam, you can only enter, as Thomas mentioned, you can only enter the central and peripheral epithelium, how to deal with that in the treatment? It, that's, that's where the tricks lie. And we had to use some magic on that. And uh, to make a long answer really short, uh, we pretended that the epithelium was even and that the astigmatism was actually in the stroma and then did a reverse calculation. Uh, does, yeah. that, does that answer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is more is, uh, along the lines that, uh, that my answer would, uh, would be. You mentioned uh, that particular cornea, I remember, uh, it has a very little toricity but this toricity was the anterior surface of the epithelium. Mm -hmm. Yet the, the epithelium measured as a lens, in this case by the OptoView, uh, clearly showed uh, oblique astigmatism. Mm -hmm. uh, the intuition of that is that the stroma was having uh, oblique astigmatism in the, in the cross direction from the, from the lens. Uh, and this was the underlying, uh, uh, the underlying base for, for our treatment uh, calculation in, in that particular case. Because as Thomas mentioned, we cannot make, we cannot populate in the, in the organ mm -hmm. camp at this moment, uh, epithelial astigmatism, Thomas. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Uh, so these are the questions that we have from the from the audience. Uh, through the both talks, I I had a, a few comments or questions that uh, I may try to address, uh, and maybe some other questions show up. Uh, Thomas, uh, I got it clearly, but maybe you may go deeper on that. Uh, the workflow that you presented is a sort of a moving target. Yeah, so new cases uh, come in, your team uh, work out the new cases. They, if they get the feedback from the field, how good, how fair, or how bad the cases result, then this enters an iteration procedure. The workflow may be improved. Uh, is this is this the way it goes? So it's a sort of a moving target that evolves through time. Yeah, it's even more complicated uh, than you described it, because <laughs> um, we we find a lot of different patients uh, or, or cases we receive. We find uh, all variations, like like David, like you also get, um, and it's hard to press them in one workflow. So we have improved this workflow, and one of our latest improvement was to check for the central uh, ablation versus the peripheral ablation, because we made the experience we did not consider this in one case, and then we thought, oh, maybe it would have been better if we would have considered and changed the sphere according to that. So then it was a little bit checked and came into the workflow, and um, but still, following this workflow, we have. Um, don't say 20 or 30 percent out of this workflow range. Yeah, because we cannot this workflow, we cannot follow. At the end, we see that if we follow this workflow, um, we are not happy with the outcomes. They do not match the wavefront uh, measurement, they do not match the topography, or some other points where we say, no, this is not a good idea to follow this strictly. And then we look further with our experts. What can be done? What can be changed? Maybe as uh, David was pointing out, check on the symmetric offset versus asymmetric, check on other parameters, check on limitations we have, and, um, and we modify it out of the workflow. But first of all, this workflow is a guideline where we always start from scratch on. And uh, sometimes, or in, in a lot of cases, we can follow this workflow and we spread it back to the customer and we always try to get data back to see if this workflow or the optimized, so the altered workflow gives us some um, advantages. So we ask for a feedback, but indeed uh, it is very tough to get feedback and to get the clinical data to make cases like we have seen by David Kahn. We have some, and uh, but um, it is, I always, or we always encourage doctors to send us a feedback back or to give us a feedback back, even if the workflow or our recommendation was not following. And finally, um, to say it's more complex, we give a recommendation and then at the end, the doctor also has to make some thoughts and decides, well, it's all good how they propose, but from my experience, I change a little bit. Yeah. So there are also some cases which then change slightly from the surgeon itself. So uh, to bridge the gap, uh, David, uh, you are also here. Uh, I I discussed this with Thomas and with his team several times uh, uh, in the past. Uh, can you remember what was your first reaction when you asked Schwind for a treatment proposal and you got something bizarre like 147 with 269 diopters at 173 degrees? Uh, how important is for you clinicians to get back to to so to your schematic of quarter diopter or eighth diopter or or five degrees stigmatism? Uh, you feel unsure, uncomfortable when you get these bizarre numbers, or how you cope with that? Well, of course, everybody gets upset, and when you get an answer that you just cannot comprehend. And we're not in primary school anymore, so we just can't follow uh, what we don't understand. And I think that's why I've written you guys at Schwinn so many emails to try to understand 
why a certain decision, why a certain number, why a certain axis, why a certain offset was selected for that. And often, more often than it is the case, uh, every case is actually different because every aberrated eye is aberrated in a slightly different way. Although I do, I can say that uh, inferior cones in primary character conics are more or less the same to, to treat. But decentrations, uh, small optical zones, or wet bed ablations, which were totally bizarre, were very, very difficult to treat and will be very difficult to treat to every surgeon because you're stepping on the boundaries of faith. <laughs> so we, we, I think we need to, to oh, not just say to the physicians, oh, that, there's your ablation, there are your numbers, punch it in and just do the trans PRK or a flat relift or whatever. We need to try to make them understand why we came to that decision, one piece by one piece. Now, not many, maybe not all surgeons will be interested to learn, but I think more than enough will want to learn why we came to that decision for that particular eye. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, the next question builds on, uh, uh, on that. Thomas, you may also uh, add on to, on to that. Uh, but uh, uh, David, what, what do you need or what was the reason for you to start doing more of those on your own? So uh, how did you get to that confidence? Because now you are conducting, as you mentioned, you have one to two every two weeks. So let's say once a week uh, you have one such a case. Uh, and you contact us maybe twice a year. Uh, so all the others are done by yourself, despite they are special, difficult, uh, abnormal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so what was the reason? How did you get the confidence? Simply by asking and getting the answer or what was the, the process to get there? Uh, feedback. The more, the more feedback that I gave you guys, the more feedback that I received. Now, I did this treatment in a particular way that you suggested, and I got this result. Maybe we should have done it this way. Maybe we should have done it that way. You know, things like that. You know, this ping pong between Schwind and her customer will make any customer uh, become an expert in that field uh, with a growing more experience. So you think that, that this is... This is uh, extendable to essentially everyone through this ping pong, as you, as you mentioned, at some moment they will get the confidence on going on their own for yes. some of those cases. Yes, because some of these cases will be similar to each other, especially primary character conics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So and classification. To, and beyond of that, I think uh, even the conversations uh, during the congresses or we met face to face it's also a good opportunity always to enlarge and exchange information. Yeah. Of course, of course. An email will, will, never, will, will never take a place of face-to-face -face exchange, of course. Yeah. yeah. But is, an email is written down and you can read and reread over and over and again. And to read yeah. behind, between the lines, look at the numbers and read it again and think about it in the morning, in the evening, <laughs> uh, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Indeed. Thank, Sam, I think there's a question for you in the in the chat room or in the question room. Because if I would get this question about the symmetric and asymmetric to explain it, I will end up in another presentation. But can you spread some words and shine some light on this difference between asymmetric and symmetric? Yeah, I can try to do it uh, uh, quickly. Uh, so essentially. Essentially, so let's start with the symmetric because it is probably what the, what the people know from other devices. Uh, in the symmetric offset, you try to shift the whole ablation from the pupil center and, uh, and the concentric to the pupil boundaries. You try to shift the whole ablation to some other center, typically the corneal vertex or the Purkinje image uh, and so on and so forth. This is what you can do essentially with 
with most of the of the systems at least for non waveform guided treatments this will be the symmetric offset you shift the whole ablation and the ablation remains uh, as it would be around the pupil but around some other place uh, in the asymmetric offset in the asymmetric offset uh, we are not shifting the whole ablation the ablation remains concentric to the pupil boundaries because this is the this is the the aperture through which the light is getting into the eye so there is a uh, good reasoning for respecting these boundaries as uh, as a limit for the ablation and yet what we shift is within that ablation the optical axis of the ablation so we try to make coincident the optical axis of the ablation which is the reference for the refraction that the ablation is having uh, to the corner vertex to the visual axis to the reference the physician wishes uh, and yet expand the ablation in a non-symmetric way for that term, asymmetric offset to still be concentric to the pupil boundaries that's the reason that's, that with asymmetric offset if you do aberration free treatment no matter with or without cylinder they do not look they do not look round radially symmetric or rotationally symmetric uh, they look different and this is coming from from this shifting of the optical axis within the boundaries of the of the whole ablation and this is very very uh, summarized but one one more thing is is important at the at the Schwinn device regardless of whether the symmetric or the, or the asymmetric offset in the Schwinn device you can apply offset also for customized treatments so from the aberrations we take the chunk of aberrations that uh, correspond to the offset you selected yeah so we do not we do not shift the aberrations this doesn't make sense we refit the aberrations to the wavefront uh, center on the on the place you decided through 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 the offset uh, as you mentioned thomas probably this this deserves a presentation on its own but I try to keep it in, in, in at least in, in short term. Yeah. If there's, in case, if there's more interest, you can mail me or this doctor can mail me and get in touch with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, at this regard, this is uh, a, a new question coming in at this, at this regard. Uh, and it is in the cases that angle kappa is present, so an offset uh, would be recommended. Uh, would you prefer shifting it under the laser or shall this be done preoperatively? So from the, from the planning. And my answer is clearly preoperatively. You make all the decisions preoperatively, you decide for the refraction, for the stigmatism, whether or not aberrations, and then just plug in the offset there and you have it uh, uh, done. Uh, but David, is there any reason for deferring this uh, until you are at the microscope? Can you please repeat that? Yeah, is there is there any clinical reason for for not using the offset in the planning and deferring its potential use for the laser? No, not really. So no. you would also go for 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 just is part of the planning which offset yes. to use. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the center of the ablation. It's it's where you. It's a reference yeah. place. It's one of the yeah. most important points that you need to take into consideration. Yeah. And actually, as we saw in your presentation, uh, it for custom treatments, it may have important effects on the ablation depth and the ablation shape. So you better know it beforehand, so that mm -hmm. you can pick the ablation should there be a need for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Thomas, I'm the moderator, but uh, you are the main organizer. We are right now at 1.30. This was the scheduled time. Uh, Let's see, we have uh, maybe left for one last uh, question. And uh, there's a question that uh, a Mel80 user had experience on topo guided um, treatments. And is the Schwinn topo guided or custom topo guided the same or is it different? <laughs> the question maybe we can address it yeah well uh, clearly it's not clearly it's not it's not the same and the, the top guided 
from the melaity has been designed to match the melaity or melaity characteristic to the to the to the best uh, ours uh, is clearly different and um, we don't even call it topo guided but it's not simply a marketing strategy uh, we do not use the topography as a primary driver we use the from topography derived corner wavefront and uh, so we really try to to trim it down to the optical effects of the topography uh, to the to the vision and not and not primarily to the morphological effects of the uh, of the topography this is the 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 main uh, difference uh, but other than that both they are coming from placido topographers in our case we use placido and shine fluke topographers uh, combined so there are similarities but they are definitely not uh, uh, not identical a disintegration will be captured by both and we'll end up in similar ideas uh, but the manipulation that you need to do in the middle 80 i really do not know how their workflow for for tweaking the treatment will uh, will work uh, yeah. I can I can figure out a, a, a last question before we we wrap up, and this is also related to something you asked David uh, before uh, about occluding corner away from the punishing the cornea for the lens. Uh, many of the things that we see about the uh, ocular wavefront are from I do not say abermeters from the past, but from abermeters that that they were having. 80 400 or 1000 uh, lens lengths for the measurement and now abrometers uh, like the eye design tool they are in 3000 plus and abrometers like the like the pyramids and uh, they are in 40000 plus so uh, they are getting closer to the density of measurement uh, that is provided by a by a topographer uh, is since then the use of ocular wavefront more common than before thomas since the pyramids is there and and the higher resolution wavefront uh, is provided is most more common to to use the yeah. way than before what we notice from our um, hotline from our department is that it becomes more and more um, available uh, that more and more people are using it and uh, we thought it might be the same reason as you were pointing out that the, the trust in the device may be coming from the more precise measurements due to the higher or much higher amount of measuring points um, is um, bringing us towards this device. If we look back in the beginning, we had maybe 100, 120 measurement points in the six millimeter area. And soon we have an overlap or irregularities and the crossover of the spots so then it improved over the time and the trust was also building up. But when we came out with the Pyramids, we have seen um, a step forward in our uh, hotline that more and more users are using the device and are asking for support for that. And the ocular wavefront became more interesting. Not saying that the other devices had been poor, but this one offers some advantages, including the number of points, including the same software like in Sirius. I think this all sums up and made it more available to the customers. Thank you. David, Thomas, any closing notes uh, to wrap up this session from your both excellent contributions? I'm just waiting for next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, in October, then it's the 10th oh, of October, right. the next okay. uh, webinar, yeah. So immediately after ESCRS. Yeah, after the we sent an invitation because then David's pointing out that Bruce Allen, who is joining us, is an advocate for the ocular wavefront. So we will see how this goes. And thank you all of you, all attendees, and uh, David and Sam for your participation, uh, for your organization and uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank, thank you, much. guys. Well done. Thank you. Stay safe and health. Yeah, stay safe and health. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.